Hi, everyone, and welcome to this E-Impulse Rebeat. Today, we're going to revisit one of our previously published episodes because it's just so important. We're going back to April 17th, 2021 with It Could Have Been Different. This episode is all about recognizing the subtle signs of non-accidental trauma, or more commonly, child abuse. It features experts in the field, Dr. Mary Clyde Pierce and our very own Dr. Julia Magana, discussing the 10-4 FACES P clinical decision rule for predicting abuse in young children. So give it a listen or re-listen, and then come back for our next episode in April, where we'll talk about ways to make this rule even easier to implement on shift. Now let's dive into the episode. So she started kind of dropping off her growth curve. So by 11 days old, she was 76th percentile. At one month, she was 57th percentile. And I think at the two month visit, she was probably in, she was in the 32nd percentile. Um, so I had been concerned. I had asked her pediatrician in Roseville, um, you know, is this normal? I don't feel like she's eating well or she's losing too much with her, you know, diarrhea. Um, and multiple times I was just given like reassurance that she was normal, that, you know, because she started in the 84th percentile, I was told she's finding her like natural weight and that it was just me being like a nervous new mom. Gabby was seen multiple times by multiple specialists. And finally, our PGI doctor really listened. He agreed with mom this was more than her just being a new mom. But he thought it was probably metabolic or medical problems that Gabby was experiencing. She underwent an extensive workup. But despite everything that they were doing, she still wasn't thriving. So he admitted Gabby to the hospital for a feeding tube placement. This is when I was called in because the x-ray found multiple rib fractures. I am a part of the child protection team, so I and the trauma team met with mom. The team that had been there had left, and it was, I think, you and maybe, like, three new doctors, like, residents or somebody, I'm guessing. And I remember it was, it was all trauma doctors. And they told me, they're like, this is no longer a medical admission. This is now a trauma admission. She's not going to the nursery. She's now going to, like, the med search floor um, because we found seven or eight fractures on that first x-ray where we checked for the placement of the NG tube and then ordered an additional test x-ray that evening, I believe. So that test x-ray, I believe, showed 19 fractures total to her ribs. Um... And I think, I think I was told right away that this was a non-accidental trauma workup. So I think I kind of went into shock and I also went into clinical mode of like, I know what this means. Um, And it was also partially relieving that it wasn't cystic fibrosis or, you know, something wrong with Gabby that was, it was wrong with her situation, not her. Gabby had a chest CT done and a skeletal survey. This showed not just the 19 rib fractures that we saw in the chest X-ray, but 56 rib fractures in various stages of healing. She also had a foot fracture and a healing right clavicle fracture. Some of the fractures were so fresh they still had blood around them. Um, I remember... I think the police called me at first and they said, we're going to come interview you later. Um, and they asked me some questions like, you know, do you know who did this? Did you do it? Um, I told them, no, I didn't do it. I didn't know who did it. Um, but that again, it was because she was only three months old at that point. She'd only been around three adults, really. Um, they started asking me a lot of questions about my husband so he came in to the hospital, and when he got there, the detectives had been interviewing me, I think, for about two hours total. They came and told me about 30 minutes into his interview that they had arrested him, and he was now leaving the hospital in handcuffs. 
he never admitted it directly, but he made comments such as, it must have been me, no one else would have done this, and that he was just acting very suspicious to them. So they arrested him and charged him with the child abuse. I knew in that moment I had become a single parent, that I had married someone who abused children. And that at the time I thought I had missed it for two to three months. Um, Later I found out I had missed it for two and a half years. I do remember Gabby would cry sometimes. I couldn't get her to stop crying at home and I couldn't figure out how to console her. Um, And again, I wasn't in the PICU and I didn't have my tricks of, you know, giving kids drugs or, you know, so I didn't, I didn't know what was best for her. And I do remember he would be like, give her to me. And he would take her into her room and she would stop crying. And I used to ask him like, how did, how did you make her stop crying? Like what, what did you do that I wasn't doing? And he would just tell me like, oh, you're stressed out. And she could, you know, she felt you're stressed and we just had to leave the room or I don't know. Like he just, he was so convincing. And now I know he was probably squeezing her until she passed out. At that point, I had no kind or positive feelings towards him. And I was very supportive with the investigation. Um, with the detectives and the district attorney's office at that point and CPS. Um, And so they had asked for Theo's medical records. They wanted to see if there was anything I'm on them. And I took them to you first. And I remember the only thing that was weird to me with Theo was that he had these like scleral hemorrhages that I had never seen in a PICU or NICU before. but again, there's things that you don't see in, in NICU, like kids fall down and have scrapes and bumps that you don't see on inpatient, like chronically ill kids. And I I remember I looked them up and up to date and there was nothing that screamed this is child abuse when I looked it up. And the first time it happened to Theo, again, was I was working a weekend shift and I came home and saw this like first blood vessel in his eye and I panicked and took him to um, his healthcare provider at the time. She reassured me it was fine that this happened. You know, maybe he was crying too hard and just got overly upset and, you know, his blood pressure was too high or something um, and not to worry about it. And so I still followed up with his primary care provider the next day. Um, She pretty much said the exact same thing, that this is normal, this happens. You know, maybe he was straining too hard, like asked if he was constipated, um, you know, told me don't worry about it unless it, you know, crosses the iris. Like as long as it's just the white part of his eye, don't worry about it, this happens. And it happened a month or two later with him and same thing, same conversation with a third provider. Like, you know, did it cross into the iris? You know, is it in the colored part of his eye? You know, I told them, no, it's just the white part. And they said, that's normal. That happens. You know, it's okay. And after that, I don't know how many times it happened to Theo. Because that just became Theo's norm. It happened to him between six to a dozen times. That he had these first blood vessels in his eyes. That I stopped taking him to the doctor about. And I remember later on looking at Gabby's newborn pictures. And she had the same thing when she was 11 days old. And I thought it was normal. And I didn't know. Theo and Gabby's subconjunctival hemorrhages were a sentinel injury. They were a sign, a red flag. A moment in time when providers could have stopped the abuse. Things could have been different. Our expert today is Dr. Mary Clyde Pierce, 
a pediatric emergency medicine physician at Lurie Children's and professor of pediatrics at Northwestern School of Medicine. She is also the director of child abuse research at Lurie Children's Hospital and the primary investigator of an NIH grant to study bruising characteristics and validate a bruising clinical decision rule to differentiate between abuse and accident in very young children. All right, MCP, you have devoted your life's work to child abuse identification in the emergency department and specifically lately skin injuries, right? Why this specific focus? ear bruises. That's what kind of really started me on this path was noticing that these kids had ear bruises before they came in with like these fatal or near fatal injuries. And so I uh, became interested in seeing if we could actually identify these early risk finders and understand a better way to interpret them so that we could increase the likelihood that we can identify these kids early on. I kind of liken it to cancer in a way. Like if we actually did a CBC in a child that had fever and we noticed that there were some abnormal cells, like a maybe an early blast type of cell, then we would actually know what to do. But unfortunately, with skin findings, we in emergency medicine are taught that you see something that needs your intervention, that's what you do something about. But you don't need to intervene on a bruise. And so I think we all just kind of look past them, not realizing that the severity of that particular injury doesn't tell us the severity of the risk the child's under. I think it's also easy to see them but not really see them because we see accidental bruises so commonly, right? Oh, yeah. So we don't actually even register them mentally. But there are special bruises. There are bruises that are unusual. And even before this particular big study, you had already come up with kind of a catchy title of the 10-4 rule, right? Walk us through what is this clinical decision rule that we now have amazing validation of and we're ready for primetime use of. Walk us through the 10 4 now faces P rule. So, originally, um, when I was very interested in the ear and I couldn't figure out how to study it prospectively because I didn't want to get like an ultra filtrate or a biased sample. And I came across a group of fantastic nurses in the intensive care unit in Louisville. So they said, well, we do like this very dedicated, deliberate skin exam on children every four hours and we document our findings. And I thought, wow, this could be really informative for us. And then I have this amazing collaborator, you know, Doug Lorenz, you work with him too, a biostatistician that's just this great thinker that helps us expand what kind of solutions we want to try to have that are practical for our clinical problems. It has to be practical or it's useless, right? So we actually collected data retrospectively first in an intensive care unit and had all of this really amazing data on these children that had abuse versus accidental injury versus car crashes. And we put that all together. And uh, Doug modeled that for us using recursive partitioning. And I was really obsessed with the ear, but excitingly, uh, there are other regions that came out as well as being strongly predictive of abuse, especially the torso, uh, which was quite remarkable. The other important thing to say is that this is in very young children. A lot of people say, oh, my gosh, this will never work because bruises are, like you said, so ubiquitous. Who cares, you know? But we're talking about really, really young children here. And uh, what was exciting is that those soft tissue areas, the soft areas on your belly or the soft tissues on your buttocks, soft tissues even around your chest or your back, those are the strongest predictors of it being abuse. And they also are uncommon places to bruise when you're just playing and having fun. Usually you have clothes on and it's softer, especially on cute little children. They have those pudgy areas. It's less cute when you're older, but <laughs> they have these pudgy areas. And when they fall, they don't bruise that area unless it's right directly underneath the bone, like along the spine or right on the hip bone. So it's really unusual to bruise those areas. And so it's easy to see how different those characteristics were in accidentally injured children or car crash children versus children that were actually being grabbed, thrown, kicked, punched, you know, some really violent things that were happening to these children. But of course, the caregivers weren't telling us that that's what they were doing. Yeah. So in the pic, you you found the torso, which I usually describe it as the area of a little girl's one piece bathing suit. Perfect. And like the buttocks, the genitals, the belly, all of the fleshy part of the back, all of that stuff, the ears. And then the N stands for neck, yes. um, which makes a lot of sense to me because it's a protected and then again, soft, fleshy area, as you're talking mm-hmm. about on a child less than four years of age that doesn't have a public or confirmed accident, like motor vehicle collision. Right. Peace out. This doesn't apply to you. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) 
or a bruise anywhere on an infant less than four months of age. Exactly. Yeah. So that's 10-4. And then we, I was honored to be able to be a part of it, <laughs> took this concept of 10-4 and validated it and even refined it as a clinical decision rule. Let's talk about how that happened. What were the basic broad methods? We wanted to be generalizable. So we actually went to uh, emergency departments and many of those children were referred right in from primary care or from schools or uh, kindergartens or wherever. And then uh, we wanted it to address the issue that we had with the number. We especially didn't have very many uh, infants. And so one of the reasons we were worried about that four mo- under four months of age being any bruise anywhere was because how do we know that was the true cutoff? We needed a lot more infants to be able to really understand what the true cutoff would be and that it wasn't just a factor of us just not having that many infants. And then, of course, we wanted to be able to have uh, more specific details on the face. We did exclude, as you know, patients with uh, bleeding disorder or severe skin conditions that would completely impact how the bruising would occur because the study wasn't designed for that. That could be its own study, but we excluded some things so that it would just be in a regular health uh, child. We designed this study with a lot of intent large group of people came together to help us think about it and design it. Um, and then I met you at a conference and you said, hey, I would like to study this. And I said, how would you like <laughs> to be part of an NIH grant I just got? And it was like, you're just, you were just so awesome. It was just so wonderful to have your energy and began our journey. And uh, we also, the most exciting part for me, uh, other than all the other most exciting parts, was that we actually <laughs> be able to work with, <laughs> with a really cool company called, their name is Slingshot. They're out of Louisville, Kentucky. And they worked closely with us to develop the software to help us develop the, a way to actually document bruises on a little body diagram that could help us be much more specific in the characteristics of the bruises. So you partnered with how many emergency departments across the United States? We went with five emergency departments, yours included. I thought it was a really powerful uh, method. I'm just going to describe how I remember it. I would come onto a shift, random times of the day, early morning, middle of the night, and I would walk in and I would tell the nurses and all of the providers seeing patients, okay, hey, we got to get everybody four and down in a gown. If you're less than four years of age, we need a full skin exam. So the clinician, as part of their normal evaluation of that child, would then do a complete skin examination on that child, and they would let me know if they saw any bruises anywhere on their body. Now, if they had concern for abuse, they went down a slightly different pathway, and I did not interview them, but our child abuse team did, and we still collected all of the same information. It just was through the child abuse evaluation process. But if it was an accidental bruise, which was the vast majority of them, as you know, then I would go in and I would take an incredibly extensive social history, we would understand the whole context around that child and that bruise as much as the parent knew. And I thought this was a really unique way to truly understand what's normal bruises. You know, I have so many people that are like nurses that are like, oh my God, I don't want you to ever see my kid because they're covered in bruises. And I'm like, I know they're covered in bruises, (laughs) so are mine. (laughs) But we just needed to understand the context of what's actually happening with these quote unquote normal bruises. And um, so it was super unique in that way. And then for those that had concerns for abuse, they answered a lot of the same questions, some of them in a little bit more depth. At my site, we had a kid that died with a bruise and other sites did as well. And finding out what the determination of abuse was. And you used a multidisciplinary panel, right? Talk to us about that. So that's always a problem when you're actually trying to do research to improve the evidence on decision making when it comes to child abuse, because there's no true reference standard or gold standard. And so how do you do that? And we already know that clinical decision making can be flawed. That's the reason we needed a rule in the first place. And so we actually uh, used a medical expert panel. And obviously the 10-4 faces P rule didn't exist. Uh, and so the um, we made it very clear that you have we don't, we want to know what you would judge with your expertise. And we also had a biomechanical engineer that was actually part of the expert panel as well that added uh, injury biomechanics thinking to us. So we had clinicians and uh, biomechanical engineer. And as you also know, we had a psychosocial team that looked at the data, and, and everybody was blinded to each other data. So the medical expert team had no idea 
about the psychosocial aspects of these families. They only got to understand the injuries and those kind of dynamics. And the psychosocial team had no idea what the injuries were. So they were uh, rating all of this all independently. Man, that's super interesting. Yeah. the In the medical expert panel, they were rating everything. They weren't in a group. They were rating them independently. And yet their agreement, their kappa was way high. It was in, into the point nines. And so it's really quite remarkable that the agreement was so good with the uh, expert panels, regardless of emergency medicine, child abuse, or biomechanics. Yeah, that is super interesting. So there was a lot of papers that came out of this, right? This is a huge study looking at a lot of different components. We're going to walk through a couple of them here. But let's talk about the big kahuna, the one that was just published in JAMA Open, validation of a clinical decision rule to predict abuse in young children based on bruising characteristics. It just came out April 14 yesterday. So super exciting. (laughs) Wow. Yes. Uh, So what were the important findings? Well, I think the most exciting thing to start off with is the 10-4, the original 10-4, worked pretty darn well. Um, it still was at 80% sensitivity, had an 80% sensitivity, and the specificity actually went up, which is very interesting. We went from 100 patients to basically over 2,100 patients. And to get to 2,100 patients in this study, we had to screen over 21,000 children. So the exciting news is that very, very young children actually don't have as many bruises as we all thought. It's like we remember these children have bruises, but they come and go. But in these moments, these many of these children were actually in their first year of life. Like, what, 400 of them, basically, were under a year of age. And so that's a pretty big number. And so there just weren't as many bruises as people thought. So you had to go through 2,100 children to even find the 20 plus, 2,000 plus children that had a bruise. So that's interesting in and of itself, I think. And then when we looked through those children, uh, most of them fortunately were accidental, which is really no surprise to all of us. 1,700, I mean, the numbers are, like, these aren't exact, these are just rounded numbers, but 1,700 plus uh, versus around 400 that were abuse. And so that's a pretty big difference. So that was actually also a, interesting. Uh, we didn't know what we were going to find, but that's what we found. Uh, to me, some of the bigger surprises in this study uh, were that the things that I didn't know before, and I'm so glad we actually developed that software to look at the little body diagrams with the drawings, uh, the skin findings on them, because we started to see really clear patterns on the angle of jaw bruising. Uh, even though there were only 73 children in the whole study that had bruising that was literally a raw, along the sides or you know, like the, the jawline itself, not the chin, but the jawline, uh, they were 72 of the 73 were abuse. Yeah. Walk us through FACES P. What does that stand for? Even though our sensitivity was 80% for a screening tool, especially with the high risk, high stakes miss like abuse and uh, the increased rates of fatalities once these kids go back into this dangerous environment, the families need help. These are distressed families if they're hurting children. The children are, are need help because they can't tell us that something's wrong. And so we really need to have a medical model where we actually apply our compassion and try to help these families and these children before it gets worse, right? Yeah. So FACES, it actually stands for F, stands for frenulum. And even though it was the least strongest, it was not a common injury because everybody kind of learns about frenulum when you're actually in the realm of trying to think about child abuse. But frenulum occurred accidentally as well in some cases when there was a clear story. None of this is magic. It's like predictors of being assaulted versus not assaulted and then using a common sense by your uh, examiner, you know, and using knowledge by your examiner. Um, so the frenulum is the first. A stands for angle of jaw, like I just mentioned. That was, to me, the biggest eye-opener. It was just like, wow. Um, and especially in infants, because they were being grabbed. And the human's hand is so much bigger than the child's face that when they went to grab them, make them be quiet or whatever they were doing, they bruised the angles of the jaw by the thumb and the uh, index finger or the forefinger. So frenulum, angle of jaw, cheek. Importantly, that stands for the fleshy part of the cheek, the outside part of the cheek, not the inside of the part of the cheek, but the outside of that fleshy part of the cheek. Um, It doesn't stand for the uh, zygoma, which is the hard part of the cheek, although that actually had many, many abuse cases in it as well. Just because it had a lot of abuse cases doesn't mean it's a predictor region because it had a lot of accident cases too. So we have frenulum, we have angle of jaw, we have cheek, which is the fleshy part. The E stands for eyelids. It's important because um, literally when you're doing your exam on patients, you have to sometimes deliberately make sure that you also look when their eyes are closed 
uh, because some of these kids were just had these like where people are grabbing them by their eyes or actually giving them a little punch in their face, unfortunately. And sometimes just their eyelids will be bruised. Um, sometimes it's real obvious, like a big black eye, and that's uh, obvious. But a lot of times it's less obvious than that. Sometimes these bruises are really quite subtle. Um, and then S stands for the subconjunctiva. So having those hemorrhages, the white part of your eye turning red, having those hemorrhages there and a young baby, that turned out to be a, a very strong predictor, although it's also not horribly common. But when it's there, you really should catch your eye, so to speak. It's really got to get your attention. Of course, we would never want a rule to supplant uh, clinical judgment. It's supposed to help inform your decision-making, gives you some more evidence so that you can actually comb through. And if you, first, you have to notice the bruise, notice the finding, and then use your knowledge to actually interpret what you're seeing so that you don't have that missed case of abuse. Like we want to be informed in our thinking and recognition of these findings. So that's what FACES stands for. And then P, that stands for pattern. It was kind of an obvious thing that had to be included in any kind of bruise finding. Um, and it was actually also a very strong predictor. But importantly, um, again, common sense is so critical here. If a child um, has one linear mark and they're actually running around like a banshee, I don't even know what a banshee is, but they're running around <laughs> and they have a single linear mark. I don't want people to go like hog wild on this, also a Southern saying, but um, it's just important that these findings help us think through. First, we have to notice, like see with knowledge, right? Yeah. We don't want to have a big net that just captures everyone. That's not the goal. We want an accurate net. This is an important tool and this is something that we need to use, but we also have to be accurate. Specificity is just as important as sensitivity for these families, you know? Right. I think it's so important that Doug, having such a, bi a fantastic biostatistician, he said, what matters to you? And I s explained to him exactly that. I said, if I had my wishes, they would be the same. Because uh, in truth, I'm a little bit more anxious about missing abuse but I, I would say it's only like 1% more. You know? <laughs> I really am very passionate about the decisions that we make and about putting tools out there that help people hopefully have evidence to help make their own decision and ask questions. When you do see a bruise and ask a question, it makes perfect sense. A perfect example is if you have a three-year-old that is in gymnastics, I say just walk away. <laughs> so they are like rough tumbler i mean like they're doing things that are going to hit their torso right and then the second thing that we saw that sometimes got overcaptured: if you have twins they tend to bite each other like they're like little piranhas they're like, hur, 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 you know? so, and so bite marks of a twin it's like okay yeah. <laughs> that's hilarious so it makes it trickier but it's like that's why it's fun doing this job into noticing and saying, what do you know about this? And tell me about this. And then if a child has an ear bruise and they have no history, that's a big red flag because these are very young children. If it's like a seven-year-old that's out playing, it's like, oh, I don't know. But if these are like one-year-olds and two-year-olds and they really supervise much more closely. And so if they're having those, your ear doesn't bruise as easily and it takes a lot of force on the side of the head to cause it. And so we did have some, I'll, I'll give you the ear bruise because that's what started my whole journey down this thing. We had 111 out of 410 patients had an ear bruise that was from abuse, but we had 23 ear bruises that were from accident. But put that in context, there were 1,713 non-abuse related children in this whole study. And of those, 23 were to the ear, but that's only 1% of that whole entire group. And so the number looks stronger, looks big, but it's only 1% of all those children that we comb through. Let's talk about this on a practical level. In your own practice, what do you do with this information? Let's just say you have a 13-month-old that comes in, cold symptoms, you take off their uh, shirt and you notice a bruise on their abdomen. There's no trauma story. What are you going to do? You know how sometimes you can feel the pelvic bones in children mm -hmm. that poke mm -hmm. out and it's not there at all, you know, like, it's okay. So it's like, let's say it's right in the mid-abdomen or something like that's going to scare me. I'm going to... First, start off by being scared. No. <laughs> but it will, it respect will get my... Respect the bruise, right? Right, respect the bruise, man. <laughs> you know, it would actually get my attention for sure. And I would actually do a skeletal survey. I would do trauma labs because a bruise on the abdomen, just think about it. There are circumstances where you get a bruise in the first place. You have to have something firm on one edge and firm on the other side. So is it possible in those abdominal bruises, sometimes we see that like a hard thing, like a fist punched all the way through or a foot stomped all the way through the back part of the spine. And so it actually 
crush those little vessels that are tiny vessels that cause you to have bruising in your subcutaneous tissue. Um, and so that one would really get my attention. And then I would, most importantly for me, uh, we have an uh, amazing social work team. Um, hopefully your hospital does too. Some hospitals do, some hospitals don't. And I would also ask them to help me understand what's going on in that child's world and their environment uh, and that family. And a lot of times you find some pretty disturbing things that you might get help with. But if you don't ask the question, you never can help with it, right? So that's the case where the abdominal bruise in a 13-month-old would cause me to act deliberately, compassionately, and uh, with the knowledge of trying to prevent something from happening in the future. All right. So let's say that it's all negative. The skeletal survey is negative. Your AST, ALT is normal. Your white blood cell count is normal. Social context is normal. Active 13-month-old. Do you report to CPS and let them do a deep dive into the social context at home? Or what do you do with that information? Um, I'd first get an ulcer. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I have one right here from a previous case like this. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> right. uh, if you have a child abuse team that can help with this, there's nothing better than that. As emergency medicine physicians, I think that you pull them in to help you with that decision making. If I were in uh, a place where I didn't have that, not knowing what I know now, I would actually report to social services, but I would tell them why I'm concerned. It's so critical when we have to report, and we don't have these teams, these amazing teams to help us. Uh, each state calls it something different, but state social services or child protective services, they don't have a magic wand or a magic bullet. They need to know what our concern is. So I would do my best to explain to them the evidence behind this and why this has me uh, concerned enough that I want them to help with uh, understanding if this is child's safe or not and what we need to do to help make sure they're safe. A lot of people would disagree with that. But after seeing what I've seen from the angle that I have, I would actually now report that. MCP, the youngest infants are the ones that I'm always worried about. What did we find specifically on infants less than 12 months of age? What was interesting is that we looked at children that were under four years of age for two reasons. The whole study was like under four because basically almost 80% of deaths from child abuse occur before the fourth birthday. And those children are too young to seek help or to even understand they can get help, and they're too young to even articulate what's happening to them. But more powerful than even that stat, I think, is that almost half of deaths from child abuse occur before that first birthday. That's pretty staggering. Yeah, it is. What we found is that the still the strongest predictors of uh, abuse were still the 10-4 faces P, those regions, the torso, ear, neck, frenulum, angle of jaw, cheek, eyelids, and subconjunctiva, and then pattern bruising. Those still captured almost all of the infants correctly. Any bruise anywhere on an infant that's 4.99 months or younger mm -hmm. um, it predicted abuse. And that was important, though these uh, motor vehicle crashes were not included in our study, as you know. Yeah. So mm -hmm. important. I don't know anything's game if you're in a bad motor vehicle crash and the child's ejected or whatever. So that's a difference. Yeah. You know, that's not what we're talking about here. But any bruise anywhere on an infant that's non-ambulating, it makes sense, right? They're not old enough. Like if they have a shin bruise, a shin bruise in a two-month-old yeah. is wow. big, big, <laughs> big deal. They're not walking. They're not banging their shins and anything. It's like, and yet I've heard people over again, it's always just a shin bruise, probably from changing the diaper. That doesn't make sense. A shin bruise in a two-month-old is very, very different than a shin bruise in a three-year-old. So great. We can think of that differently. Yeah, I think about it as like they're not able to create enough injury to crush that tissue and the blood vessels to pop, right? Like yes, they're just exactly. not able to. I love Dr. Sugars, those who don't cruise do rarely bruise, right? Yeah. Brilliant, <laughs> brilliant. And especially if they came in with a medical chief complaint, not without a trauma chief complaint of like, oh my God, my kid fell off the table. <laughs> right. yeah. I have a reason. <laughs> exactly. And that's where we have to use our uh, our clinical judgment. Uh, you know, like we always use our clinical judgment, but evidence infused sounds yes. delicious, doesn't it? <laughs> evidence, <laughs> evidence infused clinical judgment. That's what we're hoping for. Because if I have a baby that has a forehead bruise where the mom was or the dad was like, walking with the baby and they fell up the stairs and the baby has a little conk. And it's like, does this all make sense? Yeah. Is this plausible? Does it make sense? If it makes sense, I go with that. But most often, interestingly, we found that most abuse patients uh, in this study presented with a medical complaint and not a trauma history. So that's really important too. When I say that, they like present with fussiness or vomiting or something like that. Whereas 
um, rather than the complaint of like, I dropped my babies, are they okay? <laughs> you know? Yeah, absolutely. It's really important. The paper that you and I did together first on the prevalence of bruising, remember? I'm sure you do. Mm, I do. <laughs> Uh, that was published in Annals of Emergency Medicine. That was a thrilling publication for us. One of the reasons we did that paper was because everybody was like, well, we're going to be l- working everybody up for abuse because everybody has bruises. And we're like, no. And so we were able to show that the prevalence of bruising is actually extremely low in this first year of life. Yeah. So when you talk to uh, emergency department physicians about this, how do you suggest that clinicians integrate this information into their practice? Like, should we create a screening protocol? Should everyone be put into a gown? What's the best way to integrate this into your daily practice? Gosh, the secret sauce is in nursing. That's for sure. Our nurses, they have such amazing uh, exam skills and observation skills it's such a collaborative effort to actually make sure that we're thinking and capturing and noticing. And so if I had my wishes and wishes came true, I would just have four and down get in a gown and that we pay attention and that we actually notice and document and we notice and we ask questions. And if it makes sense, uh, move on. And if it doesn't make sense, we don't just like, so, well, it's just, never mind. It's just a minor injury. We don't dismiss it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that would be the first hope that we would actually change practice. A lot of emergency departments don't get children that are young down in a gown. You know, like I, I incorporate uh, looking at the skin in my physical exam and it, beca- it doesn't actually add time. You can do a good skin exam as part of your screening for child abuse. We know that cutaneous injuries are the number one manifestation of child physical abuse. So just get in there and take a look at that and then use that as your key to then ask, okay, 10-4, facies, P, does this fit into those categories? And then those ones get a deeper dive. So you're, you know, coning out big and getting more and more specific as you move forward. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. It's a screening tool, not a diagnostic tool. That's so important to say. It was designed to be a screener. And so it's just like notice it first. So it signals that the child's at risk for these findings being from abuse. That's what it signals. And some of them have a much stronger signal than others. That's why we published basically the, you know, the data that so you could actually see how the rule was built. And uh, so if you have, like, if I have a child that has a angle of jaw bruising and an abdominal bruise, that kid's at risk. There's no if and or but about it. If you have bilateral jaw bruises, it is what it is. And so to turn your head the other way doesn't help. It hurts, you know. It empowers you to see these common injuries, but being able to really see them and understand what they actually mean, which I think is the power of this whole research. So it's beautiful. Anything else you think we should know? I just think that, uh, again, the reason that bruises deserve more respect, I think that the biggest reason that there's medical recognition failure, that these children are put back in risk, is that people equate the severity of the injury with the severity of the risk. And with bruises, it couldn't be more opposite. The severity of risk is actually probably inversely related in some ways. Those subtle bruises over the eyelid or maybe a little tiny frenulum injury on that baby that's fussy. What do we do if we have a fussy baby? We look for a hair tourniquet. We look for a common (laughs) corneal abrasion, right? But what about a skin exam? What about looking at that frenulum? We had a, you know, we've had cases in our own emergency department where they were fussy, fussy, fussy crying, and then suddenly there's that frenulum injury, you know, and you actually, then they have a, then you find a rib fracture or whatever. So it's actually, um, how easy is that to do a skin exam on those fussy, colicky babies to make sure that somebody isn't losing it or that it's not the reason the baby's colicky or fussy because of a brain injury or something like that? You know, I see a lot of adults and older kids, and I'm very comfortable saying some bruises and even subconjunctival hemorrhages are normal. In adults and teens, I generally consider subconjunctival hemorrhages to be benign, and I'm happy to reassure families that these are normal and they will resolve on their own. So if I hadn't heard this podcast, I might not know that they are a big deal in kids under four. This was eye-opening for me. Pulse check. Bruises are the most common manifestation of child physical abuse, so put young kids in a gown and do a good skin screening exam. Remember 10-4 faces P and take seriously bruises anywhere on a child four months of age and younger or bruises on a child less than four years old that are on the torso, ears, neck, frenulum, angle of the jaw, fleshy cheek, eyelid, 
subconjunctival hemorrhages, or patterned bruises. Take a good injury history, understand the social context of the child, get a skeletal survey, and transfer to a children's hospital, or call CPS if things don't make sense. Now let's get back to Gabby and Theo's story. Gabby and Theo are doing great. Um, it's been a little over two years since she was admitted to the hospital. Um, she is now thriving. Um, she's a very happy, talkative, independent two-year-old. Uh, Theo, he is great. He's very smart, very physical, athletic, loves climbing and jumping. He does have some emotional problems that are consistent with children of trauma. And that's just something that he has to work through over time. Polly, can you talk about what happened to your husband, ex-husband? He was initially charged with one count of child abuse. After the district attorney got the results of the MRI, they charged him with three counts of child abuse um, and with what they called an enhancement charge of intent to cause grave bodily harm or death. Um, So he was looking at a total of 18 to 40 years in prison. He ended up pleading no contest and took a plea deal for six years. Um, And he is in a state prison right now serving that time. MCP mentioned several times that we need to approach these cases with compassion. Compassion for the kids, the parents, and I would add for ourselves. These are complicated cases, and we hope this information gives you the knowledge to see, to really see, these bruises that could be a sign of abuse. Check out our show notes for links to these articles and pass the word along to your colleagues so that we can all advocate for our smallest patients. Thank you to OM Audio Productions for supporting me during these bruise shifts at all hours of the day and night to enroll kids in this study. And thank you to our department for taking these injuries seriously and advocating for kids. Follow us at EM Pulse Podcast, and we'll see you next time. 